Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a prehistoric tapeworm has been discovered, trapped in 99 million year old amber, a new bizarre species of stegosaur has been named, two new species of living killer whales have been proposed, and more. Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Nature has made a fascinating discovery that could greatly advance our wound treatment capabilities. The study looked at the ways in which the body slows down tissue healing during aging, and in certain diseases such as diabetes. A neuropeptide is an amino acid chemical in the body that is used by the immune system to essentially communicate throughout the body. One such neuropeptide is called a calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP. Nociceptors are the pain receptors of the body that tell us when we are being damaged by something. The role of both of these was, in some aspects, unknown. For example, the role of nociceptors in healing tissue after a sudden injury wasn't entirely clear, but this study helped us cast light on how this works. The study says that sensory neurons expressing CGRP are mostly nociceptors, and that they use CGRP to communicate with immune cells and encourage healing of the tissue around the injury. The discoveries made by the team were then put to the test, using synthetic CGRP on mice that had similar healing issues to diabetic patients. Fascinatingly, healing rates increased significantly. This obviously has some brilliant implications for real-world medicinal use, and the study concludes that its findings can be used for significantly advancing wound treatment speed especially to those with diseases such as diabetes which affect it. In addition to this, it encourages further research in the field of neuroimmune interactions to help better understand how the body fixes wounds, so that we can encourage it to fix them quicker. Also in the news this last week is the very exciting announcement of a proposal to name two new species of killer whales. Orcas can be found around the world in every ocean, and although there are many distinct populations of these animals that have different feeding habits, social behaviours, languages, and even different appearances, they have all been classified under the scientific name or Sinus orca. That is, until now, as researchers have reviewed the various lines of evidence for differentiating two very well-studied populations of these animals, the residents and the transients, or Biggs killer whales, in the eastern North Pacific Ocean, which are often sighted off the coast of the US and Canada. These two groups have entirely different diets and cultures and almost never interact, and therefore do not interbreed despite inhabiting the same areas. They are also very distinct genetically, and so using all this information, the researchers propose that the residents should be named Orsinus atta, while the transients should be Orsinus rectipinus, while all other global orca populations remain, for now, as Orsinus orca. These names are ones that had already been used in the 1860s when past scientists went a bit overboard with naming killer whale species, often based on just a few differences in the skull shapes of single specimens, and rectipinus comes from the Latin for upright fin, referring to the tall dorsal fin of males, while atta means black or dark, in reference to the largely black colour of the species. They also suggest that the common name for the transient should continue to be Biggs killer whale, after Dr Biggs who pioneered the study of these animals in the region. A common name for the residents is also being planned after discussions with North American indigenous groups have taken place to agree on what they should be called. If the proposal is officially accepted, then it'll be very interesting to see which other orca populations might end up receiving recognition as distinct species, as we continue to learn more about these amazing animals and all of their differences. It's also significant for their conservation, as lumping them all in Orsinus orca can hide their true diversity and the threats to individual distinct lineages that need protecting. So it definitely seems like a step in the right direction to start recognising quite how unique they are. Some unfortunate orca news next, as there is some incredibly sad news coming from Vancouver Island. A Biggs killer whale stranded last week and unfortunately, in spite of attempts to help her, she died. Biggs orcas feed on mammals and it is thought that the female, known as Spong, became stranded after a failed attempt at capturing a harbour seal, whose remains were found close by. Biggs orcas are known to launch their bodies ashore to capture their prey and then wriggle themselves back into deeper water. Unfortunately, Spong became trapped in a trough-like depression and was unable to get out. Once she was found, attempts were made to help her, but to no avail. She died two hours later. Members of the E. Hattasat First Nation were present at the scene and draped her body with cedar boughs and performed a ceremony to release her spirit. Sadly, the tragedy does not end there. She had her two-year-old daughter with her, who is now very confused, was circling the water near her mother, and whose cries could be heard by hydrophone. 
The calf, who has been named Brave Little Hunter, is trapped in the lagoon where her mother died, and a rescue team made up of the Ihatasut and New Chatlat First Nations and Federal Marine officials are trying to lure her out. But it is not easy as the calf needs to pass through a shallow gap between a gravel bar and a bridge which is only possible when the tide is at its highest and the current is at its lowest, giving a window of opportunity of around 30 minutes a day. Sounds of her great aunt have been played underwater in the hope of coaxing her out, but to no avail. On Thursday, volunteers from the two First Nations are going to take to the water in canoes and hope to guide her out of the lagoon while beating drums. The calf is getting weak and it may be that she will have to be fed or moved, but it is hoped that this can be avoided. Brave Little Hunter belongs to a pod of orcas known as the Runaways, and coastal First Nations and whale watching companies are on the lookout for the pod in the hope of reuniting the calf with her family. Just to add to the tragedy, a necropsy was undertaken on Spong and she was found to be pregnant. This is such a sad situation and we can only hope that the life of Brave Little Hunter can be saved and that we can update you next week with happier news. First up in the paleontology news for this week, we've got the amazing publication of a new kind of stegosaurian dinosaur with some really weird armour plates. Coming from Middle Jurassic aged rocks in Morocco, it lived over 164 million years ago and has been named Thyreosaurus atlassicus. Found at a site in the middle Atlas mountain range, it's from the same locality that has produced the recently named ankylosaur Spicomelus, and another stegosaur Adraticlet. Thyreosaurus is known from a partial skeleton comprising disarticulated vertebrae from the back, some ribs, and pieces of the animal's armour plates. This was a medium to large sized stegosaur, with an estimated body length of 6 metres, and it's found to be a close relative of Dacentrurus, a large species known from Europe while also being fairly close to Adraticlet. The most striking thing about Thyreosaurus though is its bony armour. Stegosaurs and their relatives the Ankylosaurs are well known for their incredible armour, but Thyreosaurus seems to have had an arrangement not seen in any other species found so far. It had sub-oval to sub-rectangular shaped plates that vary in size and are very robust and thick, and also have an asymmetrical ornamentation, with one side having small pits and fibre bundles, whereas the other has a cross-hatched surface. The authors also conclude that these armour plates were not erect along the animal's back, like in other stegosaurs, but were instead recumbent, lying across the back. The exact arrangement of these elements is not known for certain, and there's already been a lot of speculative paleoart showing possible interpretations, either with the plates lying across the back or showing them as smaller osteoderms in the skin, while erect plates are still present. It's a very interesting new dinosaur then, and hopefully more fossils can be found that can help to clarify what the animal really looked like. Also in the recent paleo news, Worm Week has come early apparently, as an incredible fossil of a prehistoric tapeworm trapped in amber has just been described. Found in 99 million year old amber from Myanmar, this is likely the first partial body fossil of a tapeworm ever discovered, since these animals very rarely fossilise as they only have soft tissues and have a concealed habitat inside other animals. Before this discovery, the only other likely example of fossilised evidence for tapeworms before the Quaternary period were some eggs found in 260 million year old fossil shark faeces. Now though, this amber preserves a tapeworm tentacle that shows many amazing anatomical details on its outside, as well as internal features that allowed the research Researchers to identify this as a type of trypanorhync tapeworm, which today parasitizes sharks and rays. So this appears to be an instance of a marine tapeworm being preserved in terrestrial amber, which the authors hypothesize may have happened when the host animal was washed ashore and then scavenged upon by another animal, potentially even a dinosaur, releasing the tapeworms from the intestine which then became trapped in resin from nearby trees. It's a truly fascinating discovery that adds some much needed data to the incredibly sparse fossil record of these worms. And finally for the news this week, we may as well just say it's worm week now, as a surprising worm discovery has been made in Morocco. Selkirkia is a kind of prehistoric tube living worm that's likely related to the modern preapulid worms, the so called penis worms, for reasons that are probably quite evident. Well, Selkirkia has been found at many sites of exceptional preservation of Cambrian marine ecosystems, such as the famous Burgess Shale in Canada. However, its record was restricted to the Cambrian period, until now, as fossils of Selkirkia have just been uncovered from the early Ordovician aged Fezuata Shale in Morocco, another site of exceptional preservation dating to over 470 million years ago. The discovery of these worms here extends their record by 25 million years, 
and strengthens the evolutionary links between older Cambrian and younger Ordovician marine ecosystems. Incredibly, the tube structure of Selkirkia seems to have undergone barely any change in the more than 40 million year existence of this genus, suggesting that there was a high degree of morphological stasis during the early Paleozoic. So another fantastic worm discovery. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science, and we'll see you next time.